like I said in the very beginning, I'm Andy Hurt. Um, this is going to be a little bit of my background. Um, again, I think for the one that's here that had me last semester, this is going to be slightly repetitive, so I apologize in advance. Um, so I primarily have a graphic design experience. Um, when I first went to school, um, I went to school for graphic design a bazillion years ago. Um, we were actually doing like, at the time I was learning, like we were doing a lot of like actual paste up and like cut and paste and using goldenrod and like actual like masking tape. It's called masking tape for a reason because it masks out things, things like that. So a lot of these terms that that are in Illustrator in the digital format come from somewhere, and I'll kind of mention those along the way for if you guys care. But it always satisfies my nerdiness. Um, so when I came to Maine, my parents moved to the coast. Geez, 30 years ago, probably at this point. Um, so just from visiting them a bunch, and also uh, I was living in northern New Jersey at the time, right across the river from New York City. I had a variety of different jobs working in the city, working in New Jersey, et cetera, et cetera. From visiting the coast uh, and wanting to get out of New Jersey, um, I'd had enough. Um, again, I worked for a variety of different ad houses. You know, I worked for ad houses that were those like ad farms that were just busting out, uh, primarily automotive. Um, they were just busting out those, as especially being in a major metropolitan area, you know, that we're, we're probably, I want to say 20 designers, at least 20 designers, and we were each putting out like hundreds of ads a day, so it was pretty generic, pretty, you know, you guys kind of see them today when you get the paper, and it's those, like, it's, it's hard when most of our, everything is local, but you get those generic flyers or those generic, you know, auto things, and you can tell they pretty much just change the logo, and that's about it. Um, to my last job before I left New Jersey was working for that smaller ad house, which was actually kind of awesome. There was two designers, there was eight of us total in the office, including the boss, and two designers. So we had like weekly meetings where we would sit, we're working with this client for this at least week or two on revamping this project, so we would actually do like, which I never thought actually existed except for on TV or something, but we would actually sit around the conference table and chart out and sketch out what we were going to do and what ideas we had and all that fun stuff. So we actually got to be like fairly creative with, you know, myself and the other designer bringing in sketches and all that fun stuff of, you know, what we were going to do for these clients, all that fun stuff. So um, I was kind of done with that, um, was checking out Maine, liking, liking um, at least coastal Maine. Um, so I decided to check out grad school because I figured it was time to just do something else. Um, and my partner at that time was looking at um, UMaine specifically because uh, she was doing history. Um, so it had a very specific, um, whatever, you don't need to know. She had a very specific history thing she was doing, and UMaine was a perfect fit, blah, blah, blah. So I decided to check out the art department, and it ended up being an awesome fit for me. So I started working with the art department. Um, I honestly started just taking a couple undergraduate classes just to, just to do it. And then as it turns out, it was only like, I think, two or at the time, two or three more classes to get a BFA from UMaine. So I was like, all right, like, I was going to take a couple classes anyway. What's one more class and a portfolio project, I guess? So I got my BFA. I had my BA before that. I got my BFA at UMaine and then stayed on um, to do my MA at UMaine, which ended up turning into what is now the Intermedia MFA program. Um, there was some interest. And in having an MFA program at UMaine, uh, there was a I don't know, 10 of us maybe that were doing grad school y critique -y stuff anyway. So it's kind of like, well, we might as well try to get credit for it. Um, so we sort of like guinea pig the idea of, of starting an MFA program that our the now director had had for years before he even knew who I was. Um, I promise this is going somewhere. Um, so this is some of my work <clears throat> that led to uh, some of my graduate, um, my graduate thesis um, at UMaine. Um, so the graphic design background is a lot of my work is informed by my graphic design experience. Um, at the time, I was doing a lot with repurposing text. Um, I'm a big, big font nerd. I, like, I love fonts. I love text. I love working with typography. Um, I honestly sort of, not secretly, I tell her all the time, I want to take over Heather's typography class because um, I want to tackle a whole, I've never got to teach a whole class on just typography and that would I'd probably ruin it because I would get too into it. But anyway, um, so this is uh, some of my first works uh, when I started at UMean. Um, I was working with super, super light scripting. I'm not a script guy. Um, but it started off with a question, 
I think probably one of those critique group moments, whatever. We're talking about a bunch of stuff and um, the question of like, when you, I think it was with overworking a piece or something like that. We're like, well, when, how, how much is, when is how much too much? Or when is, well, so we just sort of jokingly started filling in this question, I guess, with a variety of answers and we just got really, honestly, really goofy about it. So I just decided to start this how blank is too blank project and I started cataloging on my own, cataloging um, solutions to that statement, question, et cetera. And then I decided to do this interactive script um, where I had the computer on the right. So this was, was in the main gallery. The doors were to the left side of the picture. So you walked in and the first thing you saw was this sort of weird line of text on the wall. Um, and then I kind of designed it purposely so that it just looked like, you know, if you were far enough away, it just kind of looked like this weird line on the wall. And it was all just the different statements that were completed. So you walk around the corner and then you have this little station here that you basically just input like much for example, so you have the how much is too much, and then it would catalog it. It would give me um, any repetitions, so if like much came up 12 times, it would come up and it would j basically just generate a list of how many solutions were, were there. And then I would print them out. Um, I'd have my sign shop cut out vinyl. I did a lot of vinyl work. I worked for uh, a few sign shops in the area back in New Jersey. Um, so working with vinyl I was very comfortable with. So it's just vinyl lettering affixed to the wall. Um, we're all pretty familiar with that kind of stuff now. Um, the kind of cool thing was that the vinyl lettering, what that allowed me to do was um, it allowed me to install this into a variety of different areas and go around corners, around windows. I had one, um, one iteration of this where I need to find my pictures of it, um, where I had it, and it was a small square room, but it had windows. It was in, um, it doesn't matter, there's a gallery in Camden, I think. Camden and Rockland, I can't remember. Um, but it was a small gallery, but it had windows on three of the four walls, which was kind of annoying, but was kind of cool for this project. So I went over the windows and like around like the frames of the windows and everything. So it, it looked really cool. It was kind of a pain, to, oh, so I'll go back. It was kind of a pain to take off of like all the nooks and crannies. Um, and it had one of the, I think one of the walls was brick. So it was kind of like, especially these small letters got into like every, every little crevice. Because of course, as it stays there and as the room gets warm, the vinyl like, really sets into everything. But the really cool thing about vinyl was, again, you could, you know, it was the, I liked having a variable installation as far as size. Um, I use that a lot in my work just because I think it's fun just to have an undetermined size. So it depends on what container you're putting something in or what room you're putting something in. Um, so when you have an installation, going to sort of the, the art nerd kind of stuff, an installation is basically generally sculptural but it's um, essentially a sculpture or a setup that um, interacts with the room or how it's presented. Um, so it's the way that it's presented from space to space. It's very, um, it relates to the space um, so that if it was, you know, if it's a sculpture on a pedestal, you can kind of put a sculpture on a pedestal just about anywhere. But if you have an installation, it actually works with the space and the space sort of becomes part of the piece. Um, <clears throat> if that makes sense. And then I like the idea of having a variable size thing. Um, so then this led to playing with um, some image tagging. This was early, early in the days of uh, Flickr <clears throat> when it was, I think it was all pay at the time, but the university got us accounts, which is kind of cool because um, it was a new-ish fun thing to play with. I, does anybody even use Flickr anymore? I don't even know if it exists. Uh, Probably not. Exists, nobody, really nobody really, yeah, I had a feeling. Um, but, uh, I mean, with so much cloud storage now, it, like, it's kind of pointless. Um, but I kind of like the idea of how you know, people could upload whatever they wanted and basically <clears throat> image tag it. We're all sort of familiar with tagging and all that fun stuff now. It was a little bit harder to explain back then. Um, but you could basically tag any image with any description you wanted, right? So I started filling in these blanks, or uh, rather uh, image searching some of these uh, filled in statements, so like angry, you know, absurd, you see in the background there. And I would do a Flickr search for angry, and I would pull what I thought was like, in this case, five, six, six, um, six images, and I crop them to what I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so there was some creative control involved because obviously I was choosing the images, and then I was choosing how to crop the images. But what I didn't have control of was 
um, the images and how uh, people essentially assign their meaning to these images. Some of them make sense. You see angry, you know, this crazy baboon monkey looks pretty riled up. The kid looks pretty grumpy. The th men in suits here, I don't know if I would call that angry, but maybe intimidating, etc. The cigarette box, whatever that is on the side there, I don't know how that I don't know how that was assigned angry, but I thought it was interesting, so I took this photo. You know, so I still had creative control over what images um, were being used, um, but what I, I liked is not is having sort of that lack of control of of, of how these images were tagged. Um, I originally was gonna sort of make a book and bind these things, but then as I was playing with these, like in sort of like a film strip, and this sort of goes back to my sort of my age, I guess, um, <clears throat> playing with these almost like strips of films, like almost like those old school negatives. I don't know if you guys actually might remember those, but you would get like a strip of like five to, depending on the size, five to six, you know, so I kind of like that tactile quality of like, almost, it reminded me of handling negatives, and I had some darkroom experience. Um, so I kind of like this idea, and then I also like the idea of leaving them unbound. Um, these were one set each, so it was like a word printed on, the sentence rather printed on vellum, and then one strip of images and they matched up and that was it. And then on the back I had what it was um, so that people could also, um, sort of giving up that control, people could also rearrange them if they wanted to. Um, this was for a specific show, so the box was also very specific, so I kind of like that fitting this piece into a specific container. Um, and then it was for a show that was you were allowed to play with all the art, like that was the whole point of the show, is you were able to pick up and interact with all the, with all the art. Uh, but everybody was doing interactivity and they had all these like, crazy computer interactions and whatever and then I thought it was also kind of cool that I was like showing up with boxes of paper and it was like, well, that's interactive, you're interacting with it, right? Um, which is actually harder to get people to play with than I would think. Um, when you want people to touch artwork, they never do. But then when you don't want them to touch it, they're like right in it. Anyway, um, so I kind of like the idea of being able to sort of mix and match too so the, um, the audience or the viewer was able to sort of arrange them as they felt as well, kind of like the original, um, the original images that were uploaded, so it sort of like took that control away from me, which I kind of liked. This was another experiment with it. I was able to grab a bunch of these older DVD, CD cases, um, probably at Martin's. I did a lot of art shopping at Martin's. It's actually a really good stop for, the only bad thing is like a lot of times, like if you guys are familiar with Martin's, they, they only have stuff for a limited, you know, they might get something really cool and then never get it again. But we would do a lot of, uh, it was kind of nerdy, but we would do a lot of exercise shopping there. So we would go and grab some kind of stuff to make art with purposely, just to whatever, work out our brands, I guess. So anyway, so this is one of the things, I grabbed this giant box of these tins and I thought it would be kind of a cool way to represent this, um, to re represent this piece. Um, personally, I felt like this didn't work as much. It didn't feel, it just didn't feel the same to me. The square format was a little bit weird. But it just didn't, I don't know, it just, didn't, it just didn't feel right to me. Um, and to a couple of the other people that we were working with, they sort of agreed that it was like, it just felt a little bit clunkier, even though it was still pretty well handheld. But I like to show it um, just as sort of working through the process. So all of this is, is sort of working towards a larger end goal. Um, <clears throat> but it sounds really cheesy, but I like to say, you know, we, we do really learn more from, I wouldn't say mistakes, but... I learn a lot more from stuff that doesn't quite work out. Like my ideas never come out. Like I have an idea, and then I start to work through it, and it never ever—I shouldn't say never—but generally doesn't work the way I originally had it planned in my head, um, which I feel like is a good thing. I'm very process-based, so I'll be learning something through the process. I'm like, oh, but then I found this kind of cool thing. Oh, and then I found this, and then somehow I kind of, as you guys will see as I talk, I kind of go off on tangents, and then hopefully eventually it comes together into a more formalized, finalized thing, like this one was made for a specific piece. A friend of mine was having a gallery show. It was based on vending machines for the purposes of distributing art, and it was supposed to be very accessible. Um, so the art in and of itself was supposed to be really accessible, but also accessible because these are all coin-operated. I think it was all 25 cents, maybe 50 cents. Coin-operated machines. He had a variety of different machines. He had an old, uh, I don't even know if you guys know, this old like uh, cigarette machine. And they actually used to still sell cigarettes in bars and stuff. They would have this giant box and you would put the money in and pull this lever and the cigarettes would come down. Um, 
So you could get boxes that were like the size of cigarette boxes, and you could load them with whatever art. So in each column, he had a different artist. Um, these in particular were for, um, they were really clunky but weird, but they were these old weird um, condom dispensers. And he found that you could find these blank boxes that were the size to fit in this dispenser or whatever. And it was, again, like I said, 25, 50 cents, whatever you crank the thing, and the little box comes out. Two and a half inches by one inch. Um, and I thought that was a really kind of cool format to try to fit this project in. So what I decided to do, I really should have written it down, but I don't remember. Um, what I tried to do was I think I did 29 words or 29 questions, sentences, whatever, um, and 13 images per box. Um, that's just my goofy hang up. I always work in 13s or 29s. I don't know why. If I'm doing multiples, I like to do those additions. I don't know why. It's just my thing. Um, so I like the idea of having one word per box because it spoke to the, the setup of the show. It was sort of more this like collectible show um, or like like I have kids now and they, you know, even they get all excited about the goofy grocery store, you know, goofy vending machine things and whatever. They like to collect, like even if it's garbage, they just like to collect whatever, you know, so they liked not knowing which ones are going to come out and then trying to collect all whatever, all 10 of whatever toys they're going to lose in five minutes anyway. So it sort of like spoke to this whole kind of thing, but, but being art. Um, so you could kind of collect or trade, you know, if somebody got, I already have a Humble, do you have this one? I need that. Like, so sort of that trading baseball cards or collectibles kind of thing. Um, but I also really liked how the images were cropped. Um, it, made me, it made me look at the images, even some of the same images. Um, it made me look at them differently because of the size. Um, it was more this sort of thinner portrait size. Um, images and they also felt really 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 good in the hand like I feel like it was a perfect size to sort of thumb through and again this is sort of to give it a little bit of a little bit of scale um, but it was just like a nice I don't know it felt like a good a good size for, for going through and playing with um, so then all of this there's more to it that I you don't need to see um, all this leads to my thesis exhibition um, which was essentially based on tattooing and assign meaning through tattooing and how people assign meaning um, to images and also visually communicate. Um, so going back to the image tagging thing, this was sort of derived out of a, a different photo project that I'm, I'm not showing, but I wanted to do these sort of, um, uh, for those of you that are familiar with like color field painters like Rothko, things like that, where they're doing these massive washes of color. Um, I had the idea of with a macro lens um, taking photos of someone's tattoos and obviously experimented on myself first but at like the macro level so you're getting this like crazy crazy zoomed in where I was hoping that it would be like this sort of like color field painting and I wanted to have this I wanted to I think it did them five by five feet by five feet images printed so like have this you know I don't even know how small of a but like a tiny tiny little maybe an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch piece of skin blown up to five by five feet. Um, I thought it might kind of turn to these cool like color field, paint, but then it ended up looking like, since it was so macro, it almost looked like like the surface of a planet kind of thing. It totally didn't work for what I wanted to do, but it got some cool imagery. But then it sort of led to this. I sort of zoomed out a little bit and went back to sort of the cropping of the images when I was playing with the How Blank is Two Blank pieces to get to, um, to, get to this series to where I would, I would back out a little bit to where you could sort of recognize what something was, and then also seeing the title kind of helps a little bit. But you still sort of got this, this image out of context. And then you had the words that the collector would have them fill out a list of tags um, that they would ascribe to, if they were to image tag their tattoo, um, uh, as many as they could think of uh, image tags to go along with the meaning behind their tattoos. So then what that led to was I etched, um, I had my sign shop, I basically made a mask. Um, instead of giving me the letters, they gave me, they pulled out the letters and basically gave me the mask. Stuck that over the glass and there's actually, it was fairly easy, there's actually etching cream that you can get, you just paint on, let it sit for a little while, wash off and it actually etches into the glass. Um, there was a couple different things I tried to do, like I would try to actually use frosted vinyl um, and then also try to paint with like a light wash um, the paint actually didn't work really well on the glass for obvious reasons. Um, and then the frosted vinyl just kind of didn't, it just didn't look right. It looked like 
it looked like I put frosted vinyl on glass. It didn't look, it looked like I tried to fake etch something. So I was like, well, I might as well just try to etch something. So the etching actually worked out really well. And what I liked about the etching, and I show these different angles is, as you look at it, as you look at the images, um, the actual pieces, depending on the angle that you look at, the, Im the, um, the text becomes more prominent or drops back, um, you know, so you can see. So the viewer, you get that light interaction to where, like, depending on, you know, how the viewer angles their body or lets the light hit it, um, you know, you can see image first or text first or a combo of the two. Um, it was kind of hard to get it, to get an image without, with the text really dropping out. Um, but, you know, you can see even this almost front onto a view from the side. You know, you can see how the text really sort of almost becomes opaque. Um, and then what I also liked was this almost natural drop shadow that would happen since it was on the top of the glass, and then you had a layer of glass, and then that was on top of the image. You had physical space, so you would get shadowing and like this nice, as sort of a graphic design guy, you got this sort of nice natural drop shadowing happening as well if you looked, if you looked very close. And again, yet another, um, another close-up of that that sort of natural drop shadowing that, that kind of happens as well. Um, so again, sort of going back to, you know, some light interaction. Um, I have generally, I like to have some kind of interaction within my pieces. Um, you know, this and another piece I'll show you, you know, I had that light interaction where you're literally just moving your body, kind of things like that. Um, then this goes back to, um, I won't go into the whole story, but it's, it's a reference to another artist, um, Richard Prince, who had these joke paintings that they were formatted this way. So that's why I kind of formatted this piece um, in this way. But I was at a, a show of his. There's a security guard. He does a lot of stuff where he has machines basically make things. And the, the security guard was like, well, that's not art. Machines don't make art. Man's make art. So this is sort of my, I feel like every artist has to have their art about art piece. So this is my sort of art about art piece. So what I did was I had that statement that he had, the machines don't make art, man makes art. And then what I did is I dropped out one of the words to try to change that statement sentence as many times as I could without rearranging it but just dropping out a word um, and then I, again I cut it off so you have like the MA and the N on the next line just that's sort of the nod to the artist that it was referencing um, and then for another specific show I had some shirts made thought it would be kind of cool on a t-shirt um, so I did a small run I think I did 24 total I think um, I couldn't do 29 because of ordering doesn't matter um, I wanted to do my, my multiples, 29, but it was batch ordering of 24s or, or 12s, so that didn't work out or whatever. So I just did 24. I did 12 of each shirt for a specific show, sold the shirts, So I because I figured this thing is also ginormous. It's in my basement right now. Um, so it's like 5 foot by 6 foot vinyl lettering on a giant a yellow acrylic piece. So I had the chances of somebody probably wanting to purchase that was knowingly probably pretty slim. But I figured t-shirts are a quick, easy sort of takeaway. Um, but this was also going back to originally to sort of taking away that control. I was also playing around with the idea of um, you know, how much can I remove myself from the creation of a piece? And is it possible to completely, for the artist to completely remove themselves from the creation of a piece? I feel like the obvious answer is no, because you have the concept and therefore you're already, you're already involved. But basically all I did was I had the concept, I set up the Illustrator file, and then I gave it to the sign shop and I said, whatever you have that's giant and cheap and whatever color you think goes well with it. So they said, well, we have this really crazy yellow piece. It's like five foot by six foot, it's perfect. And then I let them determine whatever color they wanted to put on it and they thought that maroon vinyl would be fine. Uh, sort of the same thing with this. I, I, you know, I gave the t-shirt guys my files and I said, you guys, you know, give me a variety of sizes, 12 each whatever colors you think would work best. So that was sort of like trying to remove myself myself from the process. But again, I had to set up the file and then in the grander scheme of things, I had the idea. So I don't think it's possible for the artist to completely be removed from the situation. Um, and then I believe this is sort of lastly my personal stuff. Um, this is a piece that was, um, we were talking about sort of going to that assigned meeting. Um, like people watching is one of my favorite things to do. Um, so you, like, I don't know if you guys do it, but sort of when we, you know, we, we all sort of, I wouldn't say, I don't mean judge in like the sort of capital sense, but like we all kind of like when we see somebody, we kind of sort of have predetermined, yeah, like we have predetermined conceptions of how they're gonna be or whatever. Um, so I was kind of thinking about that. I was actually at um, 
it was like a TJ Maxx kind of store or something like that. And they had these mirrors, they had these goofy like back to school mirrors that were like, it was a picture of a head and it was like text of like stuff to remember to walk, like brush your teeth, comb your hair, wash your face, things like that. Um, and they were super, super cheap. So I grabbed a couple of them because I figured I could make something out of them. Um, so then I got this idea of doing this sort of mirror thing and the, the going back to the assigned meaning kind of thing and taking these tags and what kind of sort of tags would we ascribe to people. Um, so some of them were a little bit, of, some were innocuous, some were a little bit more forceful, etc. So you have harmless, guilty, I'm trying to read some of the other ones. Um, I had humble in there, whatever. Um, and then again, I sort of hung them in a similar way to that, that line of text. Um, I purposely set them a little bit higher than eye level, or no, a little bit lower than eye level, rather. I tend to go high because I'm a little bit taller, um, but I set them lower on purpose, as you can see. Um, these are some students at UMaine playing around with us in the sculpture studio. Um, so like to fit, like I figured what people would do is to try to fit their heads into it and try to see like what matched up with them or whatever. But then what he's trying to do is he's actually, the guy in the front is actually trying to fit the guy in the, in the back, is trying to fit him into the reflection. So it kind of got this like fun crossover interaction with like trying to fit other people or since it was in a square room, you would get multiple reflections in one. So people would try to sort of group them and move their bodies to try to group them together, things like that. Um, so again, sort of going back to my, my graphic design roots, sticking with sort of the same theme when I was talking about image tagging, all that kind of fun stuff or assigned meaning. Um, and then this sort of light interaction uh, as Generally, I mean, I, I kind of go all over the place with it, but generally sort of what, and especially at this time, what I was kind of working with, um, and then incorporating signage and a lot of graphic design. This is all, most of it was all set up in Illustrator. Um, so I've used Illustrator to create all of this stuff, to create art. Uh, and then I'll quickly go through some of my background as a graphic designer. Um, so these are some of my professional projects. I still work as a freelance graphic designer doing a variety of different projects. Um, these are all local local businesses. Um, Atlantic Kingdom Seafood um, is an exporter of Maine seafood, obviously the most being lobster. So they wanted this strong, strong uh, text lobster image. Um, and then using a variety of different illustrator tools and pathfinder tools and layering and layer ordering, things like that that we'll all go through. Um, you know, I had sort of the part of the lobster's claw going over the L um, you know, part of the L behind so it looked like it was in the claw and then the other claw kind of like pitching over the K but then some of the letters are above so this is where a lot of the Illustrator stuff that we're going to be learning gets, gets applied with um, text, text editing, kerning which we're going to talk about is one of our first assignments which is basically letter spacing. So working with text and working with layering, imaging, pathfinder, things like that. Um, this was the original logo that I did for Ono Brewing Company. Um, again, working with, uh, they're the owners, that, for those of you that may or may not be familiar. Um, they also own Woodman's, a restaurant in uh, Orno. And they had this mountain as their logo. So they wanted to incorporate the Woodman's Mountain into their brewing company logo somehow. Um, so that's why we did this hop with the, with the mountain sort of cut, cutting off the top of the hop. So we did this hop mountain that they wanted. And then this is sort of like the, the sheet of the finals that they got. We had all sorts of different color, color selections, things like that. But the full logo is the blue, um, the blue, green, and orange, um, which we used color matching systems to, to actually, so they have like their official colors, their Pantone, Pantone colors, which we'll get into later. Um, so you have one with the blue black background, one without the background, black and white, or black and gray, and then one just black, and then a variety of different other um, different other applications, and then just the word mark, and then they wanted this third, third logo to pop that they still use here and there. This OBC to pop on other things, um, as well as sort of like a like a third logo. And then re relatively recently, we changed it up. Um, we found that having that sort of square format um, worked well with a lot of applications, but then didn't work well with putting it when they did a lot of collaborations or events or things like that. It was kind of the rounder logo, and also this sort of more um, landscape logo worked a little bit better and they kind of wanted to stylize it a little bit more. I think at this point they'd been open for about five years or so so it was kind of time for a for a refresh. Um, so the more important thing was keeping the hop. The hop mountain has sort of become their brand um, and then the Orno Brewing and they've dropped the company. Um, so the Orno Brewing may change time to time 
um, but then the hop is always going to be like the brand um, and what what they go for and what people go for. So again, using the um, their standard colors, and then again a black version, and then a couple different color varieties, um, and then we worked into um, they recently started canning, so we started doing thank you. So we started doing um, some labels for cans, um, and what they wanted to do is I mean it's especially now like the craft beer market is a super super saturated market. You know you go into you go to Hannaford and you go down the beer aisle and you know there's hundreds of even craft beers. I mean they're usually the bigger companies, but craft beers even in Hannaford. So there's a lot of companies fighting for a limited amount of shelf space and also a you know a very very um, what am I looking for? It's a very saturated market, so you you have a very limited time to grab your audience. So a lot of labels and especially the more craft beer companies. Um, you know, if you go into more your, your, your more traditional bottle shops, liquor stores, um, you know, you see a lot of the craft beer companies are trying to do more interesting labels to grab, to grab the attention. Um, I like to hopefully think that if, you know, if a company is taking the time to design an awesome label, hopefully what's inside the bottle or can is going to be just as good. If they take the time for that, then hopefully they take the time to do a quality product. So for this one in particular, we wanted to go with, um, the owners are very, very into skiing and things like that, so they were thinking this old school, um, late 80s, early 90s ski jacket, Saved by the Bell kind of theme, because the, the IPA is tubular, so they were going with that like tubular 80s kind of thing. Um, so that was kind of fun to do, and again, which we'll get into later, you know, using Pantone colors, so these are all color matched, um, or color matchable. Um, colors so that you take them to any print shop and you know that they're going to come out exactly how you want them to come out. Um, this is another one for their Van Life IPA. Um, and again, we sort of are sticking with a similar format where we have, you know, hop and name is in the same location. So we sort of have our own little like template and then info on the right. So that's never going to, I shouldn't say never going to change, but the placement's basically never going to change. Um, but then the label will always change so that no matter what, you look on the shelf and you'll know hopefully it's an OBC can. Um, this one in particular we set up so we're all of the white space in the van. I keep pointing to my screen like you can see it. Um, all the white space in the van, um, pretty much all except the informational white space, was actually a knockout, um, which means there's nothing printed at all on it. So what they do with these type of labels um, is they print a white layer. They're on clear labels and they print a white layer first and then they print kind of like priming and then they print on top of the white layer. So what we did is I did a knockout where the white in the van, so all except the name and those bars, the informational bars, were white. But anything else that was white was actually knocked out. So there was no color to be printed. So they actually didn't print white on that white layer, so it was still clear. So the silver of the can showed through it. I have a sample of it, just show you. But. It's about to stay. It's so, so yeah, so that was kind of a pain to set up. Um, and again, working with layers and all sorts of craziness and Illustrator and Pathfinder tools and knocking stuff out and cutting and pasting and all this fun stuff, that's how these were created. So you can see on the image on the right, it's, you know, the cans are kind of sweating, but, but you can see where all that, you know, you can see the difference between the silver and the white, but where all of that white was in the van on this side, in this file, is the silver of the can on this side. And then the tubular, <clears throat> we recently went back to the, the ones on the right were, were shrink, not that you need to know this, were shrink wrap labels, which are kind of interesting, um, but ultimately a pain to deal with because you had to order like however many of a particular brew. So we went to the inline labels, which we transferred the tubular design to the inline labels, which you could just, they're just labels on a roll, and then you can just order blank cans. It's just a lot easier and more cost effective to deal with. Um, so we're interested to see if we can still do that knockout um, which I believe we can. We still do that knockout with the labels uh, with Van Life. Um, and then this one, these are really new. They just hit. They just hit the shelves. For those of you that are 21 and over, um, this is for Deerigo Brewing. What they wanted was that sort of like tiki, tiki drink glass kind of thing. And then um, he wanted a sort of India. Yeah, exactly. Like an Indiana Jones kind of font with it. Because um, it's a tropical wheat beer, et cetera. All they do is lagers, so they do like all these plays on lagers. Um, so this was using um, the image is obviously a Photoshop. Well, not obviously, but it's an it's an image um, rather than a, a vector based image. But then I did some some vector 
um, uh, a vector gradient on top of it and then using some layer ordering um, and um, uh, layer blending, blending modes, which we'll get into, um, changing the color, because I think this was, I want to say the original image, the tiki was kind of like a dark greenish, and so they wanted the tiki to have this sort of like mango-ish, like a ripening mango kind of color. So using, basically all I did was I threw a, a, sh a rectangle over it with a gradient, how I wanted it, and then using layer modes um, and blending modes and things like that made it look like seamless, hopefully seamless so that it was actually the the glass and then the back is just a, a vector bamboo background um, and then this one was all vector the red sky at night um, which is a sort of they wanted to sort of have a nod to uh, um, it's a sort of more reddish ale but they wanted to sort of have a nod to um, uh, what was the movie apocalypse now so they had the old the original apocalypse now poster um, was this river in Vietnam with helicopters in the background, but it had this really cool smoky sunset kind of thing. Um, so this was this was completely done in Illustrator. There's no raster images in it at all. It's all vector-based um, using, again, shapes, text, etc. cetera, um, setting these up. And again, we sort of were setting up this template for them to use now where like information generally is gonna be on the left. Their legal information is on the left. Logo is generally in the same place. It changes a little bit here and there. Um, but but generally, you know, going back and forth, the name the name and info is generally going to be in the same place. Um, the reason that the bottom changed here, where you have the brewed and canned at the bottom, and then a lager by, because that's a nod to the poster that they wanted, they were sort of making reference to. And then the actual um, the actual labels in in context. That the one on the left is their photo. They did this really kind of cool. Um, event release picture where they had all these, whatever, all these fruits and things like that. Um, so these are the cans, the actual products as you see them to give you a little bit in context. And they wanted the Kaora, they wanted that to be basically what is on the shelf to essentially almost look like the tiki glass. So it was like we set it up so it was almost dead center if you centered the can on the shelf. Um, and then lastly, um, the last full time job I had. Um, in Maine was I was doing graphic design for a company called Intention and what we did is we specialized in um, dye sublimated tension fabric um, event spaces um, usually for these giant um, why am I blanking giant conventions things like that so this setup as you can see there's nobody in it so it's kind of hard to see the scale but you can see the computer monitors and you kind of see on the sort of middle left-ish there. You see the podium with a, with a stool, so it kind of gives you an idea of scale. Everything in this piece, except for the harmonic logo that goes across the middle, everything is fabric. So this is all printed fabric, and it's basically like giant pillowcases, and then it's stretched over aluminum tubing, um, which probably 20 years ago now was, was a game changer for um, the, uh, the event industry. Um, because it just made it a lot. You used to have to print these and either fix them to boards or you had like these physical, these really, really heavy physical things that you had to, bless you, that you had to set up. So now you could have these things that broke down basically just like a tent. So it was just a giant pillowcase. You break it down, fold it up, and it all packs into bags that are like the size of like a small hockey bag. Um, and you could do these, these giant, really, really lightweight. They're really easy to rig to the ceilings and things like that. Um, this was an expandable piece that we did for what I also learned through having this job was that the pharmaceutical industry is like the definition of disposable income. Um, they would do the most insane, really, really cool setups for a, a pill that they might sell. Um, but anyway, so these pieces were, uh, again, the frame on this one was a little bit different. It was expandable, it was a, it was a little bit sort of like a track frame. Um, and I believe this one went from the small one was 40 feet, and I think it went to 100 feet square. So these are large, large pieces. Um, and then the circle signs here um, were basically just the same thing, or a pillowcase stretched around a circle sign. And then again, being fabric, the ones on the left were a sheer fabric, and then they were backlit, and we had like a ring. So it was just a ring that fixed inside of the top of the circle sign, and then hung down, and then that middle thing was another ring. So there was a tunnel 
um, like a like a tube basically that you would put the frame into. So they gave it a little bit of weight, but then also tightened it, and then it hung down to another tube. But then we were able to backlight it and kind of do these. I mean, it related to the product, I guess. Um, but it was you're able again to do these like kind of really simple but kind of cool effects um, with these things. And then I believe yeah, this is the last one. Again, to sort of give the idea of scale of the types of things that we were printing. So having to print and manage files and work with files on this kind of scale was a totally different, totally different animal than I was used to. Um, but this was for uh, the Hockey Hall of Fame inductions, which we've done, I guess, every year now, probably the past five-ish five years, five-ish years. So basically what it is is, again, the same kind of thing. This arch is um, all aluminum tubing, and then it's actually inset so that where the images are, um, it's actually inset a little bit. And then they change the middle every year. So all we do is we print this panel that just zips into the arch. So we basically had to make the arch once, and they've used it for the last five years. And then we just change the, the inside panel. And then this is made up of, so our giant printer that we had, or still have, I guess, is a 10 foot wide. So we can print, and then it's just on a roll. So you can essentially, obviously not limitless, but almost an infinite you know, size you know, uh, print, uh, and then beyond 10 feet wide, they're, they have to be hemmed, or they have to be sewn together, so that's another consideration to where these are printed. So this, this I think, I think it only, no, it had two. So it had two hems in it, so that's another thing, like when we're outputting these things, like we have to consider, we work with the fabric team, we work with the, uh, the patterning team, and then they work with the graphic designers to determine, you know, obviously there's no spot in here where seams aren't gonna go through the image, like obviously they're going to have to go through the image. So we all kind of try to determine, you know, usually with the graphic designer is like what's, what's the ballpark to make this not look terrible. Um, and so we all kind of work together to try to, you know, hide these, these seams. And again, too, like this is, you know, this is about as close as people, you know, with these giant, giant things like this. I mean, people aren't, you know, people aren't like this close to them, but you know, you're not going to see the whole thing. So generally you can get away with a lot. Um, and then there was weird resolution things where like we printed at 75 DPI, which is really odd. I don't know why not 72, but apparently 75 was our sweet spot. Um, so we could also, I was so used to having, you know, everything be 300 DPI at the size you want to print it at for the crispest, you know, blah, blah, blah. But since we're printing on fabric, it softens out a little bit, but then we're also printing massive. And then you're also, you know, these things are hanging 50 feet in the air, so nobody's ever going to be that close to them. So we could actually get away with like, having lower lower res files, which was kind of interesting. So this is a whole like different kind of learning curve with graphic design. Um, and then I'm working on a whole different series like based on repurposing some of this stuff and going back to the pharmaceutical things, like generally what they would do is they'd have a show, set it up, and then toss it. And then sometimes it would come back to us, sometimes it wasn't, sometimes we'd, we'd repurpose liners if we could. But for a lot of the graphics that came back to us and they never want it back, like, we can't really recycle them because it's a 50-50 poly. I mean, so we could use them. We would make bags out of them, so we would sort of kind of recycle them in-house. So we'd make bags to have other clients' stuff go out in. Um, so instead of throwing them out, we would try to have them come back to us. But then I was starting to take pieces of these things and make, I was like, I can make something out of this. I have this, I have this free material, basically. Um, anyway, yeah. And then there were some companies that I found out that did like, like Timberland had like all these crazy, like in-house conferences that they would do. And we'd be, I don't know, every couple of weeks we'd be like printing out tons and tons and tons of fabric for them um, for like training purpose. They would have these like, they would have these training seminars in a room like this and they would have like all their crazy images and whatever and then they would be done with them. And it was just like, anyway. Learning about um, companies' disposable income was very, very interesting. Um, and now we're growing, I still say we, but now we're going to where we're doing a lot more permanent installs. Like this led to a couple more permanent installs. Um, for those of you that may follow hockey, um, last season we did all of the graphics, well, 99% of the graphics for the uh, Detroit Red Wings new arena. So if you ever see a Red Wings game on TV, pretty much almost every single graphic in that arena we did, which is kind of cool. Um, so anyway, yeah, so we're doing more, more things like that. Question? We did do the Super Bowl yeah. trophies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are going to be – those actually just shipped out um, for the Patriots fans in the room. Um, when they unveiled um, 
when they did, was it the ring ceremony or the banner, yeah. whatever they do, um, they had these giant, giant Super Bowl trophies. They had five of them roll out um, that were like, I don't know, the footballs fit on a 22-foot box truck, and we had to have five tro- – we had to have a truck for each trophy, so that's how big these goofy things are. Um, but, yeah, we did those, and then we actually ended up turning those around. We had to R&D them, so we had to research how – because we've never done this before, and it's a football-shaped thing, and how do you make that out of aluminum tubing? Um, so we had to research it and develop it, and so from – time we got the call to do it to the time we delivered it and set it up on site was like three weeks which was like insane for that kind of thing and then we also did um, we did that uh, for those of you guys that have gone gone we did um, the Patriots Hall of Fame that's also part of I think it's next to the stadium I don't think it's actually with the stadium but they so we did some more permanent installs semi-permanent installs um, when they redid their their Hall of Fame so we're getting a lot more into like the the sort of we always say semi-permanent because it's fabric that you can easily easily replace, but doing sort of more of these permanent installs. But um, yeah, when football season starts, we just truck them down to to Gillette. I think last weekend, so they're going to do something with them again. So they might they might bust them out opening night again if you want to see. It's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, so that company did intention did that. Um, so those kind of those kind of projects. But it's really interesting to see what you can make out of. I mean, it's just aluminum tubing and stretch fabric, and you can make something look pretty three-dimensional and, and heavy, um, which is kind of interesting. So that's, I know that was a lot, but that's, that's where I sort of come from on an art level, but then also on a professional graphic design level. Um, all, all of this at some point um, using some sort of digital, all of this uses a digital, um, some sort of digital uh, tool. Um, a lot of it for me uses Illustrator. So this is where you, know, you can do creative, you know, straight up, creative work with Illustrator uh, and Photoshop, but with the Adobe Suite, uh, I sound like a commercial right now. Or you can do, you know, not that graphic design isn't creative, but you know, a little bit more rigid graphic design, um, or crazy conceptual art with graphic design and using Illustrator. Uh, any questions?